I'm Enrique Serna. Next on Conversations, Thailand's condom king, Michai Veravedia. He's known globally for his brash and quirky campaigns to promote family planning and safe sex. It earned him the Gates Foundation Global Health Award. Next, we'll find out how this economist became a health activist whose aggressive efforts to promote condom use have helped to reduce the spread of HIV in Thailand, a country with a notorious reputation for its sex trade industry. The condom king, Michai Veravedia, next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. Michai Veravedia, thank you for being here on Conversations, all the way from Thailand. Um, we appreciate it very much that you're stopping by. You know, we are marking the 30th anniversary of the recognition of AIDS uh, by the Center for Disease Control. A lot of your work has also been to try to stem uh, the tide of HIV and AIDS. Where do you see us now in the world as far as the fight is concerned? Well, at the moment, most people in the countries that can afford it believe it's not a serious disease and they have drugs. But that's not the answer. The answer is that for every two people who can treat, five new infections occur. And for many of the poor countries in, in the world, in particular Africa, they just don't have the money to pay for the drugs. It costs about $13 billion dollars a year at the moment. So we have been very weak and therefore we need to be very much stronger on prevention. I still believe that prevention is the only cure and we have to continue doing it and a lot of people have sort of relaxed and uh, we ought to be more like Coca-Cola, continue doing it all the time. We cannot stop and many countries have sort of relaxed, uh, sort of fallen asleep at the wheel and so you'll see the infection rising again. Have they fallen asleep at the wheel because of the cost for the medications or because there's this feeling that it's not as big of a problem as it once was? It's a combination of both. One is that, well, it costs a lot of money, so let's not worry too much about it. It's the poor who are getting infected. You know, they're, no, they're, they're, they're no loss. And at the same time, it's just an attitude that you know, prevention doesn't get you many things, and probably in many countries, they would rather use that money to buy something for which they are rent-seeking behavior that might be successful. Well, let's talk about Thailand, your country. Uh, you are known in Thailand as the condom king. Mm -hmm. Do you like that title? Well, no choice. It was given <laughs> uh, almost 40 years ago, and it stuck. It was supposed to be an insult in the beginning, really? but it stuck as a joke, and then it, be, it was on radio and television, all the cartoons, and now it's an official name in the dictionary for a condom. So very few young boys are called Michai now, except when the condom breaks. <laughs> when you said that it was meant to be an insult, was that because of the people that opposed you and yeah, what was, you were trying to do? Yeah, it was a very famous columnist. He said he knew me and he thought I'd gone over the border and, you know, impropriety and, you know, create all sorts of promiscuity, etc., etc., etc. Any good, decent, young human being shouldn't be doing that. And he wrote that column, it was called The Mi Chai Story, based on the film Love Story. And uh, then it stuck, and now it's no longer seen as any insult at all. And I'm not worried, I'm, I'm delighted. Your work, really, so many years ago, it, it, it was really aimed at kind of dealing with poverty in your country. Well, basically, we were a very, very poor country. In fact, most Asian countries were when I began about 40 years ago. And one of the ways to stem poverty is to go to the root cause of it. Why do we have all these people living in, in poverty? It's because we have more children in the family than the family can afford to, to, to feed. So let's uh, try to reduce the demand on the resources in the family and the nation and build up the resources. And that was the family planning program. So each family would space their children more, and some, if they wish, could limit 
but spacing was a key element. And when, when a lot of people decided they wanted to space and succeeded in spacing, they said, well, let's limit at the number that we feel comfortable with. Now, when you started this work, um, were you a part of the government at the time? No, and I, when I was proposing it, I was an economist in one of the government departments. But it took six years to get the government to say yes, and when they said yes to have a policy, there was no money. And that was the time for me to jump ship, to come outside and do programs, get resources, in particular to inform the people what to do. So we went in educating teachers, getting get children involved. We knew that if we were to succeed, we needed to work with children. So that was it. And the other one was to make sure that contraceptives were available in every corner of the country, rather than just to let them know family planning exists, you must be able to get pills and condoms in every village in the country, and luckily we were able to do that. Now, you created a nonprofit that is really doing all of this work, um, but I guess the idea of uh, trying to reach out to your fellow countrymen and women to embrace the use of condoms, at the time when you were doing this, was it controversial? Was it something rejected religiously, even by the government? I mean, what, what motivated you to say that that's where we need to go? Well, the pro problem was very clear that we had a lot of people very poor, and then when we saw the resources available to get them out of poverty, uh, it, it, it spelt very clearly that we could not afford to do it. Therefore, we need to reduce the number of children being born each year to each family. So that was a very clear signal. And in the beginning, the government was not against it, but the government just did nothing. But you had mentioned earlier about religious opposition. This happens in some Catholic countries. But in Thailand, before I began, I knew that you know, religion had to be handled or understood, or, or religion had to understand what we were doing. So I got a team of, of scholars to go into, the, uh, into Buddhism and take a look in the Buddhist scriptures. Is Buddhism opposed to family planning? And we found many, many instances from the, the scriptures to say that Buddha supported family planning. He was married, he had one son, and that was the end of it. He didn't have any more. And in the one very strong quotation from the Buddha scriptures, it says that births cause suffering. Therefore, if you can prevent birth, you also prevent suffering. So I used that and sent it all over throughout the country. And then the people came back and said, Kudmi Chai, could you please ask the monks to bless these contraceptives with so-called holy water? Because everything they do, that is new. A new room attached to the house, a new house, a new motorcycle, a new vehicle, whatever, it's blessed. So I went to one of the monks in Bangkok, uh, uh, and he said that, yeah, I'll be happy to do it. You know. And I have pictures of my holding a bowl of holy water, the monk sprinkling on pills and condoms for the sanctity of the family. And we send these pictures throughout the country. So Buddhism was not against it. And nobody came out. And in fact, not even the Catholic Church did anything at all in, in, in Thailand to oppose it. Because we tried very hard to explain that we're just trying to provide a better life. Tell me about the change. Because uh, it had and has had a huge impact on the population. Well, 37 years ago when we started family planning, we had seven children per family or per woman, and that was just horrendous. There was no future. And in the program, we tried everything you know, to publicly educate, to let the people understand, let them participate. And the, the most uh, popular contraceptive was not the condom, it was the pill. The women decided the condom was a bit like the overture, like a spare tire. <laughs> became more and more, more uh, important in HIV. But during the days of family planning, it was the pill. And that went on, the people liked it, and in the end, uh, we got the numbers down from seven per family down to under two children per family. Today, it's about 1.1 child, or children, if you like, per family, and the population growth rate came down from about horrendous 3.3% per year down to now we have 0 0.4. We are replacement, below replacement level. And, and some people are saying to me, we've got to stop family planning. And I've stopped doing it for about 15 years. It's the people who are doing it themselves now. We don't have to promote and advertise. It's just a matter of ordinary family behavior now. As you were doing family planning, uh, then eventually the AIDS crisis came to be. How did it hit Thailand? And, you know, Thailand is 
very much known uh, for its uh, kind of notoriety here with the sex trade industry. Mm -hmm. Well, when HIV hit Thailand in the sort of mid uh, 1980s, the first case was 1984, known in the hospital, uh, 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 a male who had sex with male at that time, and it was just generally thought that was that was it, and then that spread into intravenous drug users, and then from intravenous drug users to commercial sex workers, then from commercial sex workers to the male customers, and then to the girlfriends and wives of those, and then into the, the children. So the whole system was there, and we knew that we had to face very serious consequences if we could not stop this. So I tried, uh, with the help of Rockefeller, to educate the public, and, but the government stopped us. They said that we do not want any public information on radio or television because it would harm our tourism. Mm. And I didn't believe that at all, of course. And I tried very hard to continue, but it was almost uh, hopeless. So I went to the army. I went to the commander-in-chief and said, Sir, this is the situation in Thailand. The number of young men being recruited and being infected was some areas up to 14%. I said that we won't have much of an army in the future if we don't, don't change this. And so he said, what, how can I do to help? So I asked him, could we use your 300 radio stations and your two television networks? In fact, they had more radio than the government. And again, taking no as a question, and he said, okay, I'll help you. And that was the beginning of it all, uh, of getting public education program going on radio, television, and people heard about it, and the government be sort of... Uh, um, couldn't do much against it. And then before long there was a change in government and the new government came in asked me to join the cabinet and I jo joined to take care of tourism, broadcasting and so on and so forth. But I said to the Prime Minister, everyone needs to be involved in HIV. The Prime Minister, you must become the chairman of the National AIDS Endeavour because Ministry of Health is not a powerful one. We need everyone to be involved because the consequences were very, very dire. So we had public education, and I was in charge of all broadcasting, so I required every radio television station, six networks and 500 radio stations, to have half a minute of AIDS education every hour broadcast, mm -hmm. and gave them half a minute extra to advertise and earn money. So it was a sort of a win-win situation. And this went on, we had AIDS education in the workplace, in the school, everywhere. You know, condoms given out in bus stops, at toll booths, Everywhere, condoms everywhere. And as a result, luckily, according to the UN, we saw a 90, 90% decline in new cases. And according to the World Bank, 7.7 .7 million Thais had been prevented from being infected. So that was how serious it would have been. And luckily that we sort of came out of it ahead. So today it's down by 90%, but the other 10% is still requires some, some continuous hard work. You're known for these quirky campaigns that you come up with uh, to, I guess, really to get attention and to grab people's um, just attention and time to realize that something can be done. Where do you come up with these ideas? Well, firstly, uh, we take no as a question rather than as an answer. Say there's a water flowing down a stream and somebody dams it, the water has to ask itself, can we get over it? If we can't, can we get underneath the dam and come up the other side? If we can't, why don't we evaporate and come down as rain on the other side? So never give up the first one. The second one is to realize that it's much easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And if you're trying to do something for the public good, um, I just realize that you've got to get attention of the people and edutainment is much better than education and lectures. And getting the people involved is one of the reasons why we succeeded was that we got the people involved. We got people in rural uh, setting. We got the local shopkeepers to understand and to provide, to be trained and provide pills and condoms. We had family planning songs for the kids. We changed the music of Jingle Bells, so to speak, and had every contraceptive method in Jingle Bells. We changed the alphabet, you know, a secondary alphabet whereby you know, B for birth, C for condom, I for IUD, V for vasectomy, and then had a snakes and ladders game 
where you land on, on anything anti-family planning, you penalize anything supporting it, you move ahead like mother takes the pill every night, a very good mother, move ahead five. And then later on you see uncle buys condom, oh excellent uncle, move ahead another three. And then later on you see uncle gets drunk, doesn't use condom, come back and start again. <laughs> All those things we were done, uh, that, that were done there and, and it got people to be, be uh, interested in what we were doing and it made sense and you've got to start young. So we had university kids helping to train secondary school kids and secondary school kids helping to train primary school kids. And at the end, all primary schools uh, gave out AIDS information plus a condom to every household in the country, every household. One of the things uh, you have said is that fear AIDS, not the people who have AIDS. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very, very important that there was a lot of misunderstanding in the early days of AIDS education because they use fear uh, as, as a way to, to get people's attention and that didn't work because that created uh, a, a reaction whereby people were afraid of people living with HIV and so tremendous discrimination and so on and that had to be worked on too and it took quite some time and now we in our country we have a special program where we call positive partnership we get people living with HIV and to find a buddy who's not infected, to work together, we train them, we supply loan fund, and they do business. And the one that's not infected has the responsibility of creating understanding and also helping to, to generate understanding in the community and to encourage the person living with HIV. It's been going on for about six, seven years. It's worked extremely well. Uh, the attitude to the people of chain, the people living with HIV, uh, are, are very happy with life now. They don't feel depressed as they did before. So and the, the other one is that money talks. They have now more money than they had before through their own means. They borrowed the money, but they paid it back. Because it's really like a micro-lending type of approach. It is, it is, yes. you know, Your uh, foundation is, or not the foundation, but the uh, nonprofit is called Population and Community Development Association. Um, it, what I find interesting is that uh, through this and the work that you've been doing here, not only did you start with the family planning aimed at dealing with poverty and then dealing with the AIDS crisis and safe sex, but now your effort, as you mentioned, uh, with this uh, Positive Partners, is really aimed at taking people in the country but giving them the opportunity, hands-on approach to be able to mm -hmm. create a life for themselves you're doing this out of the box and you're also doing this in a way that is uh, really aimed at giving that hands-on experience mm -hmm. for people. Unlike, as you mentioned, you and I went to school, we sat in a classroom, but this is different. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have five fingers in my hand. I think that's enough to count. The first finger we did was to reduce births. Luckily, it succeeded. Second one was to reduce deaths of HIV. That luckily were. We had three more. We call it PEP, P-E-P. Poverty, eradication, education, and philanthropy. We need philanthropy very much because we need to get a new generation to realize they must share. At the moment in all of Asia, including my own country, Thailand, the attitude towards giving is still pretty low. Uh, most people are still enthralled by profit and materialism rather than sharing. And we also need to improve our tax deductibility. That's the first one. So that's what we're working on. And the education, we're using education as a whole new way. A school must not be a, a school as you and I, and most people know it. It must become a lifelong learning center for everyone in the community. Most schools openly for, for only 200 days a year. So a lifelong learning center, center and a hub for economic and social advancement for the entire community. Now we're moving that into primary schools that are owned by the government. Now we're, that's on, on experiment at the moment. If we succeed, if we get resources, then we can expand. And the other one that, that's very, very important is the poverty eradication program. We match companies with communities, rural communities. And then the people in the community must come up with what they would like to see in life. So we train them, they come up with a very, very good so-called development plan. The money that's required comes from the company, but it's exchanged with tree planting. So the poor, the people in the villages, provide labor. So it's like a joint venture. You provide labor, this provides cash. And they must plant trees. Every tree is about $1.35 in exchange for the money. That money goes into a fund 
a microcredit fund, which we call the Village Development Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a pub proper bank, but it's, it's a fund operated and owned by the villagers. We don't run it, they run it. And then people have to submit. If you're living below a certain level, then you can submit. But before you can get a loan, you must be trained by what we call our barefoot MBA to prove the teacher will train you and say, okay, these three are now ready for the loan on pig raising or chicken raising, but the other two need further. And so that the bank, uh, which is elected, uh, eight members, half must be women, and they take a look at your loan and, and your, 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 your request for the project and business, simple business plan and say, well, you know, where am I going to get the pigs, how much food, where am I going to sell it, at what price, what profit, and so on. And then the loan is given out. And then they repay. And that money just keeps on growing so that they are in charge of their own destiny. So there's an environmental cleanup. Before you can uh, get the load, you must also clean up the environment. Mm -hmm. We look at your house. If it's dirty, you can't borrow it. You clean it up, and then you can borrow it. And, and the kids help to do that. So these are the things that self-help. Do you uh, find it easier to work with men or women? I think the women are just far superior in my country. Uh, unfortunately, we've uh, had women doing many, many things in business and in the communities. But in terms of top jobs in government, in uh, listed companies, uh, they're still very ignorant of the brilliance of the women of their own country. Uh, do they not respect them? Oh, they respect them very much, but they're just, they control the, the, the power. The men. The men yeah. control the power, and they're totally ignorant. So I say a lot of these men must have had problems with their mothers. <laughs> Uh, I want to ask you quickly about a couple of other things, and, and one is uh, the cabbage and condoms restaurant yes. change the, the chain that you have. Well, firstly, we have two arms in our uh, endeavor. One is our nonprofit, which works in a vast area of in, in, in population, health, uh, poverty eradication, education, and so on. That's let's call it the money spending arm. We have a money making arm, a separate legal entity, which pays tax and has profits, and the profits are plowed back. About 70% of our work is funded by the profits of these businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like some foundation in this city that you uh, may yeah. have heard that of. That little place across the street from yes. here, yes. Um, so that's the, the uh, approach we have taken to be self-financing, self-sufficient. And then the money-making arm does all the business. We have resorts, we have hotels, small ones, um, um, shops, not as many as 7-Eleven, but, uh, and, and restaurants. The restaurant's called Cabbages and Condoms. The name came from my philosophy from 37 years ago that was that if family planning was to succeed, then contraceptives have to be as easily found as vegetables in the villages. So cabbage and then condom for contraceptive and vegetables, condom, uh, um, cabbages. And, and that's how the name came about. We have 20 in Thailand, and we have two in Japan, just opened one in Oxford, and I'm dying to open one in, in Seattle. <laughs> that would be, I'd love to have you open and one And all coincidentally, we give out condoms in our restaurant, and, and all the paintings, we have pictures of Superman, Santa condom, everything in, in made of condoms. And after the meal, you get condoms, and at the resorts, we have about five resorts, by the same name, cabbages and condoms, and we put condoms under the pillow, not not chocolates. We've got a couple of minutes left here. Um, in 2007, you received an award from the Gates Foundation, a uh, Global Health Award. Along with that came a, a million dollar prize along with it too. How have you used that money in this work? Well, we're immensely honored and grateful that we received it. We didn't expect it. So we've used the money hopefully well that we started off for social enterprises, that their business that can only put their profits back into to charitable activities, one for the stock exchange in the hope that they will influence other listed companies to have one the same, to increase you know, philanthropy. The second one was for a very well-known business school in the university, and their uh, specialty is in accounting. So a lot of these people become chief uh, uh, operating officers in terms of finance, chief finance officers, and they would perhaps do the same thing in terms of more social enterprises. Then we set up a company 
called social equality to buy stock minimum number of stocks on the listed companies on the stock exchange to go to their AGMs and try and find out and push for more positive role in for women in corporate world and in society as a whole will have an, an, an sort of an e-letter to say that these companies are still uh, struggling and maybe we should consider uh, uh, our purchases with these companies. And then the, the fourth one was to set up a company called Bread, Business for Rural Education Development, the profit of which would be used to help continue long-term funding of a school that we established with the same money. We've also established the um, a Global Warming or, or Climate Change Foundation for Thailand. And then finally, our most favorite one is the school, which is a lifelong learning center, a whole new approach where kids are part of the selection committee for the teachers. They pay their school fees in community service. For every lunchtime, the kids must do community service. In fact, they're being trained to be future teachers because that's what our country needs most. And I'm sure that every country could do with good and better teachers. We have a whole new way of teaching and learning. And these kids uh, are from poor families, so their school fees are paid with 365 hours of community service and 365 trees. Again, uh, that, that's the, other, the last part that we use. It doesn't cover all our costs, but it was a beginning without the Gates uh, uh, Global Award for Health. We would never have been able to start it, so we're delighted with it. Michai Vera Major, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Fascinating work and continued success. It's been a delight. Thank you, Enrique. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.